Red Bay Church, it's good to see you this morning. My name is Derek. This is my friend Gracie. And look, guys, we have a live stream coming today from Pastor Todd with a message that's going to be powerful and inspiring. So true. And before we jump into that, we want to ensure we give you guys time to share today's service with your Facebook friends or your family. And if you're at a local watch party around San Diego, be sure and take a photo. Tag us on social media at Reve.Church. We would love to see where you're joining us from. I love it. And guys, look, as you're sharing this message and passing it out to your friends and family, hey, you're helping them come into contact with the love of God and they get to experience that brand new life that they get to have with Jesus Christ. Absolutely. And you guys have impact we could never have. So be sure and leverage that for the better today. Share today's service with someone you love. We'll give you three minutes and we'll be right back. my friend Derek and we're so glad you're here with us today. Yep and before we dive in we want to acknowledge our special newcomers. Thank you for joining us and guys leave us a comment down low and it's going to allow us to get connected with you. If you're looking for more ways to connect and grow with the people and the mission here at Reve, be sure and visit us on our website, reve.church, where we have small groups for everyone to join. Yep, and as you're looking at the small group guys, you can also check us out on Facebook and Instagram. We're gonna post daily encouragement, and this is gonna help you continue to power through your week. Absolutely, and in just a few moments, we'll actually be transitioning to our time of tithes and offerings, and this is just a time where people from all walks of life can help contribute to the mission and the vision here at Reve. And today you can give safely and securely in less than 30 seconds by visiting us on our website, Reve.Church. Yep, and before we transition into giving, let's watch this powerful story of generosity. Hey guys, Todd here with our Outreach Director, Andre. And we just want to take a moment and share with you the amazing impact that we've been able to have as a church in terms of serving our city in really, really practical ways. Yeah. 
And Andre, it's been amazing. And first of all, I just want to say how grateful I am to you for your leadership, leading our team, leading these initiatives. Yeah. Uh, it's really been uh, amazing. amazing. Yeah. No, without a doubt, it's been amazing. We reached three million pounds of food donated <laughs> and outreached in wow. 2020. Wow. That's three million pounds that we just God was able to allow us to love the community yes. in unique ways. Yes. And it really changed, and especially the, the last little bit, I wanna say thank you to you guys for volunteering, for donating. Uh, it made a huge difference in October, November, and December, just to make a huge impact in the community. Yes. And Andre, you wanted to share a little bit of what's gonna happen next in this next phase. And we have some really exciting things. I think we have some new trucks, some new volunteers who have really brought a new in inspiration and impact and they've had connections throughout the county. Parts of the county that currently are not connected to the other food banks or other outreaches. Yeah. And some of those are the, the Native American reservations around the county. Yeah. Campo, Palma Valley. We're going to outreach in the future just all the way out there to, yes. to individuals that we're really excited to show God's love to. Yeah. And all this is possible because of your generosity. Reve, thank you uh -huh. so much for being a generous church. So you can see right there, your generosity, guys, is really helping us making an impact in this city. And we've made it easy for you to give today. If you visit us at Reve.Church, you can give safely and securely, guys. So we want to thank you right now for your faithfulness in giving. Absolutely. And today's going to be powerful, so let's jump right in. Hey, guys. Todd here, pastor of Reve Church. So glad that you're joining us today. Today you're in for a treat uh, because we have one of our board members, Pastor James Grogan, who pastors East Lake Church. Uh, he's going to be sharing a message with us in just a few minutes. Now, uh, Pastor James uh, and East Lake are very influential here in San Diego, in Southern California, and beyond. And uh, they are one of the reasons that we were able to launch Rev A Church here in San Diego in 2019. And we can't wait to share this message with you. As we continue, let's jump right in. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke out against all the walls of segregation and injustice that divided us. And as a nation, we both remember and celebrate his life and legacy. But we still have so many walls of division in our country and our culture, don't we? I mean, we have uh, uh, political divisions, we have uh, religious divisions, we have divisions of wealth and opportunity, we still have racial divisions. I mean, we have divisions regarding which season of The Bachelor was really the best, just to name a few. And so with all of these divisions that we have, how in the world could we possibly have unity? I mean, is there, is there something that could be greater than the things that divide us? Is there something that we could be more committed to, more passionate about, more trusting in than the things that seek to divide us? The answer is yes. But it's not a something. It's not a what. It's a who. Let's look again at our theme verse, not just for this series, Jesus Over Everything, but let's look at our theme verse for really our church for the entire year. Here's what our scripture says. Colossians chapter 1, verse 17 through 18. It says, He, Jesus, existed before anything was made. And now everything finds completion in him. He is the head of his body, which is the church. And he is the most exalted one holding first place in, everybody together say it out loud, everything. Jesus holds first place in everything. You see, only when Jesus is first and everything else is second, can we experience the unity we were created for and the unity that our world longs for. That's the only way it can happen. Did you know that unity is so important to God and it was so close to the heart of Jesus that it was the central theme of Jesus' prayer, kind of his final prayer before he was arrested and ultimately went to the cross for us. Jesus prayed for unity. He prayed for you and I. Look what it says in John chapter 17. This is part of Jesus' prayer there. 
Jesus prayed, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me. That's you and I. Jesus was praying for us through their message. I pray that they will all be, what is that word? One. Just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. You see, unity in the church is what God uses to show the world who Jesus is. It's one of his strategies. And a divided world needs to see a united church more than ever. Did you know unity was one of the most attractive qualities of the early church? Those those first few generations of Jesus followers— Uh, The early churches that we see and read about in Scripture, they were far from perfect, but they were uh, full of of people from all kinds of different cultures uh, and and religious backgrounds. They were full of, of wealthy people and poor people, men and women, all treated equally as brothers and sisters in Christ. And in a violent first century world, that was full of divisions and classes and sects. This diverse Jesus community that loved one another and was unified in a single purpose stood out. They were attractive to a divided world. And so the question for us today, as we talk about this subject, Jesus over division, is how can we The church today, which the church isn't a building, the church isn't a place, the church is people who live on Jesus' mission. So in our generation and in our time, how can we do the same? How can we make sure that we are unified and that we are making Jesus attractive to others during such a divisive time in our country and in our world? And here's how we're going to do it. Here's how we're going to do this. Uh, Today, we're going to look at three important things that Jesus must be over. And then at the end, we're going to look at one great Jesus story. So let's start with the three things that Jesus must be over in our lives. So for us to overcome divisions and to be an example of unity, we must place Jesus over politics. Jesus over politics politics. That's right. We are tackling the big one first. Uh, We all watched um, just a little over a week ago the terrible violence of a mob storming our nation's capital. Uh, And like you, when when I saw that, I was was shocked, saddened, and as American, frankly, embarrassed— that this is what it's come to in our country at this time, in our culture. And and, and as I I processed and and thought about about what I saw and thought about like how in the world uh, did this happen and and how did it come to this, I think there's all sorts of reasons of of how it got to that point. Uh, One of those being just honestly what we've allowed in our country, uh, the lack of civility and decorum in debate and conversations when it comes to differences in politics. And so as a nation, I look at all of us and say, shame on us for what we've allowed. And this is what happens when we speak the way that we've spoken and when we have a lack of of decorum and civility in our society as general. But the other thing that I thought of is how in the world could something like this happen? Is that I think we saw a group of people who gave a person more than a vote. They gave a person their heart and their hopes. And if we are Jesus people, We need to remember that only Jesus gets our heart and our hopes at that level. That he alone gets my allegiance. He alone, as our scripture says, is first place over everything. Now hear me clearly. I am not saying don't be involved in politics. Be involved in politics. Vote. 
fight for justice and change where it's needed and policies that you think matter and make a difference and serve people well. But if you are a Christian, if you follow Jesus, here's what I'm asking you. Do so from a perspective where you put your faith first. What I'm saying is view your politics through the lens of Jesus. Do not view Jesus through the lens of your politics. You see, if Jesus is first, we can love one another unconditionally, even while disagreeing politically. And our nation needs to see a group of people who can do this really well right now, who are unified, who love unconditionally. Look at the encouragement the Apostle Paul gave a young pastor, Titus, as he's leading a young, diverse church in a, in, a, in, a, in a divided, violent culture and world. Here's what he said that church people, Christians, were supposed to do. Look at this, Titus 3, 1 through 2. Remind people, in other words, remind the church to respect their governmental leaders on every level as law-abiding citizens and be ready to fulfill their civic duty. In other words, to serve others and remind them to never tear down anyone with their words or quarrel, but instead be considerate, humble, and courteous to everyone. What do you think would happen if every person in our nation who claims to be a Jesus follower would live out the words that we just read? You know what I think would happen? I think the church and the way of Jesus would be so attractive to a divided world. So here's what I'm asking you to do, Jesus people. If you're a Jesus follower, I'm asking you to lead with love this week. Regardless of how you voted, that we lead with love. And we do that with our words. We do that with our social media posts. We do that in our conversations because if we will, it'll make Jesus attractive. So if we're going to show the world how to overcome divisions and be an example of unity, Jesus must be over our politics. And then secondly, we must place Jesus over our preferences. I'm sorry, our personalities. We must place Jesus over our personalities. Now, what do I mean by that? Personalities. What I mean by that is our favorites. That's what I mean. Not letting the personalities of our favorite leaders in the church or or different styles of churches or ministries to let that divide us. It takes all kinds of churches and all kinds of people to reach all people for Jesus. And so you need to know In this church, we are not against any other church that preaches Jesus and lifts him up as the way. We're not against it. We're all on the same team. We're for them. We don't think we're the best church or the only church. We think every church has a unique mission and that churches choose different styles of ministry. And so we need to not let those kind of personality or style things divide us. Did you know this actually was starting to happen in those first churches? And the Apostle Paul, who started many of the churches and, and, and gave direction to them, and many of our scriptures are his letters to those churches, he writes to the church in Corinth that was kind of experiencing a little bit of division because they started playing favorites. Look at what he says to them. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no division in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Now, for some members of Chloe's household had told me about your quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. Some of you are saying, hey, I'm a follower of Paul. Others of you are saying, I follow Apollos, or I follow Peter, or I follow only Christ. I mean, has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. 
I think it's pretty obvious to catch what was going on here. What happened is people in the church started playing favorites. Paul was the church planter. And Paul, if you read him in the New Testament, he was kind of this, you know, a uh, little bit in your face, tell it like it is kind of pastor. And Apollos was, was a, uh, no, was, scripture talks about him as a gifted speaker. He was a, a little more refined, uh, a little more smooth, kind of like the differences between Pastor Mike and myself. Very similar. Here's the reality. It's okay to acknowledge different gifts in people. And it's okay to connect differently with different pastors and leaders and styles of ministries or churches. But it's not okay to let those differences divide us. In fact, one of the things that I love the most about our church and about our church network is our diversity. Our diversity of, of leaders, our diversity of pastors, our diversity of teachers. We have middle-aged people. We got grandpas. We got really cool millennial Chinese, you know, lady teachers. I and mean, we got this incredible diversity on our team. I think it's one of the gifts and it's one of our strengths. And so let's be united in thought and purpose. Let's put no one before Christ. So if we're going to show the world how to overcome divisions and to be an example of unity, Jesus must be over politics, over personalities, and then here's the third one, I already said it, our preferences. Jesus has to be over our preferences. Uh, in this church, we've always taught this principle this way. Here's how we have always said it. We have always said that in the essentials— we have unity. In the non-essentials, we have liberty. Now, what, is, what, what does that mean? It means we keep the main thing the main thing. And in the things that aren't the main thing, it's okay for us to have a difference of opinion. And that difference of opinion doesn't need to divide us or destroy the work that God is trying to do collectively through us. And sadly, that's happened in so many churches and among so many Christians throughout church history. So many non-essential things have divided Christians and churches over the years. Within the last hundred years, just a few non-essentials that have brought to divisions to churches, usually they center around cultural lifestyle issues. Things like, let me give you a few from just the last 50 to 75 years in America. Things like secular music, dancing, and alcohol, just to name a few. Uh, reality is you look at church history in America, entire denominations and groups of churches have said you can't do those things and be in our church. Or you can't do those things and really be following Jesus. So what does the Bible say? And what is our church's position on things like that? Well, let's just talk about these three that I mentioned, right? Like secular music, dancing, and alcohol. First of all, when it comes to secular music, there is no such thing as secular or Christian music. It's just music. It's just sounds put together in, in timing and, and, and different pitches that create music. Music isn't Christian or secular. Now, there are lyrics that are Christian or secular. Some lyrics glorify God, and they celebrate the life that he has given us to experience on this planet. And other lyrics, they glorify sin. They might oppose the ways uh, that God asks us to live. So when it comes to music, use wisdom. Uh, simply when it comes to what you watch, what you listen to, here's what we've always said. Be careful what you consume because eventually what you consume consumes you. So simply use wisdom and be careful. How about dancing? Uh, you know, like, like, like there are actual groups of Christians that have said some dancing is of the devil. Now, some of it probably is. That's why I gave up twerking and grinding. <laughs> now, there's an image you are not going to be able to get out of your head for some time. You're welcome. Is all dancing bad? Clearly not. Now, how about alcohol? Some groups teach that Christians shouldn't drink alcohol at all, 
And they even have gone so far as to say that if you do, it's sin. Let me just tell you, that is not in the Bible. Jesus' first miracle was what? That he turned water into, anybody for bonus points? Water into wine at a wedding reception. It was like the greatest open bar in the history of wedding receptions. That's what Jesus did. What does the Bible teach? The Bible teaches moderation. Don't get drunk. If you're getting drunk, you're crossing the line into sin. That's what scripture teaches. And if you can't drink in moderation or you've had a problem with alcohol in the past, you probably shouldn't drink at all. That's called wisdom. The point is when it comes to these kind of non-essential cultural issues. Did you know that the first church had some of these same kind of problems? That there were some people that ate certain things and other people that said, oh, you know, because of how they were brought up as Jewish, those things are unclean. And so now you have people in the church that some said this is okay and others said this, this wasn't. Because they came from such diverse country and cultural backgrounds, now they're in the same Jesus community. Some of them celebrated holidays that people thought, wow, those are pagan from the Romans and other people didn't celebrate those holidays. And so what was the church to do? Well, the Apostle Paul gives some great instructions in Romans chapter 14. And the reality is that some of these things might be okay for some people, and some of them might not be okay for others. Some of them might have the liberty from the Holy Spirit to do certain things, and others might feel like the Spirit of God is telling them not to do certain things. And guess what? Both are right, and both are okay. And in Romans 14, the Apostle Paul speaks to this. I encourage you, read the entire chapter on your own, but I'm just going to highlight, as you can see there, a couple of verses. Here's what he says in Romans 14. He says, Accept the one whose faith is weak, without quarreling over disputable matters. In other words, these are non-essentials. These, aren't, these aren't, aren't the main things. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. In other words, let's build each other up. Let's not tear each other down. So whatever you believe about these things, celebrating holidays, drinking alcohol or not, eating certain foods or not, keep these between yourself and God. That was his advice to the early church. He's saying over and over again, don't push your freedoms on others. Don't push your opinions on non-essential beliefs on other people. The reality is we don't have to agree on every little thing to love one another and have unity in this church. Let's keep Jesus' way and his mission the main things here. Now, I just want to give us a final thought to consider, and really a Jesus story that illustrates this final thought really, really well. Here's our final thought for today. Our why determines our way. Our why determines our way. What I mean is the way that we handle division, the way that we handle people who don't believe exactly what we believe, the way we handle people that are different than us, the way we even handle people who oppose us has to be based on our why. Here's a great Jesus story that shows us how Jesus did this. It's found in Matthew chapter 9, and here's what it says. It says, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax collector booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up, and he followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now let's pause right there, just for a second. Make sure we caught everything that was going on. Jesus invites Matthew to, to be one of his disciples and follow him. But Matthew 
was a tax collector. In first century Jewish society occupied by the Roman Empire, that was like the worst thing that you could possibly be because you were viewed as a traitor by your own people. You were, you were serving the oppressive Roman Empire. And when you would tax, they would tell you to ask for 20%, and most tax collectors would say it was 25, and then they'd pocket some for themselves. And so they're ripping off and taking advantage of their own people. And so tax collectors were hated. And so here's Jesus, this, this rabbi, this teacher who, who talked about God in ways that nobody had ever really heard before, who has this incredible following. And the Pharisees, they were this religious group of people that thought of themselves as better than everybody else. And so when they say, hey, why is your teacher eating with these sinners and tax collectors? It wasn't just a question. I mean, they were, they were accusing. They were, they were shocked. They were, they were saying it with disdain. Like, how in the world could you possibly be with those people? Isn't that the same thing that people say today? I mean, how can you be friends with those people who vote like that, who post things like that, who say and do things like that? But let's look at Jesus' response. Jesus overhears them. And here's what happens. On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And why don't you go and learn what this means? I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, Jesus said, but sinners. This is one of the many instances that we see where Jesus placed his mission to reach all people. He placed his mission first priority in his life. Jesus, why, determined his way. You see, the way Jesus treated Matthew and his friends was based on his ultimate why. Jesus himself, a Jew, could have looked at the way that Matthew was taking advantage of their people, and Jesus could have pointed an accusing finger and scolded him and told him how wrong he was to steal from his own people and to serve the Roman Empire. But something more important than being right, because Jesus would have been right to say all those things, but something more important than being right directed Jesus' way. It was Jesus' why. And again, what was Jesus' why? Jesus' why was that Matthew and his friends would find eternal life. Jesus' why wasn't overthrowing a corrupt, oppressive empire and governmental system. Jesus' why wasn't overthrowing those things. Jesus' why was eternal. Jesus' why was much bigger than any government or any structure. Our why must be bigger than any government or structure. Again, I'm not saying don't be involved. I'm not saying don't call for change or don't champion policies that serve people well. I'm just saying as a Jesus person, put those things into perspective. Let's let Jesus' why be our why. That people would come to faith in him and have their eternal destiny changed forever. Let's let that ultimate why, the kingdom of God, the ultimate restoration of all things. Let's let that be what drives us and leads us in the way we respond to others. As we close this out, understanding the links to which Jesus went to reconcile himself to us can powerfully motivate us to endure opposition and respond to our opponents, not with divisiveness and retaliatory anger, but instead with love. When we think of how Jesus treated you and I, how Jesus handled it when we were divided and separated from him, 
How does Jesus treat and handle you and I with love, with grace, never canceling us, never blocking us, never putting us at arm's distance, but welcoming us and loving us again and again and again. That should be the standard. That should become the way that we handle and respond to divisions. You see, Jesus is our example. He is our why, and he has shown us the way. We want to share a song with you right now that is titled, There is Nothing That Our God Can't Do. It's really an incredible prayer of hope. And as you listen to it, I want you to consider what you heard today, how the Holy Spirit has spoken to you and maybe uh, challenged you. As we step into this all-important week as a nation, I want to remind us of, of something that I think intuitively we all really know, and that is this, that no human being can heal the fractures and wounds in our world. Presidents and policies can certainly help, but they won't ultimately heal. Only the love of God, as seen through the gift of Jesus, can bridge the divides, close the gaps, and bring the healing and restoration that we all and our nation so desperately needs. And so this week, will we lead with love? Will we allow Jesus to be over everything, including our divisions? Will we be a united church a group of people that in all of our diversity, because we make Jesus the main thing, that we can love and we can have unity even when there is not agreement on secondary smaller issues. There is nothing that our God can't do. And so let's pray and let's partner with him to bring the healing and the restoration that we individually and we collectively so desperately need. Let's pray together. God, I thank you that as this song says, there is nothing that our God can't do. And as we look at the state of our nation, our culture, maybe even our own lives, God, would we today be filled with hope that you can bring healing, that you can bring change, And that you want to use us, your church, your people, to be a shining light in the world. That we would be attractive because of our love and because of our unity. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power. This week, we pray that God blesses you in your leisure. We pray that God blesses you in your labor. And just want to speak Ephesians 3.20 over your life. And now to Him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine, according to His power that's at work within us. To Him be the glory and the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. God bless you guys. Stay safe. Stay healthy. We cannot wait to see you soon.